A sobering update on Zika today. The nation's top health officials warning that the Zika virus appears to be a lot scarier than first thought. A stark warning that the haunting images of babies born with microcephaly in Brazil, abnormally small heads and brains, are becoming a very real concern in the U.S. Birth defects caused by Zika virus make it a terrifying disease. But it pales in comparison to a far worse infection that plagued us through much of the 20th century. Many of us think of German measles as just another one of those harmless childhood diseases, and that is true, it can be. But it also can be, as polio was, one of mankind's worst cripplers. A severe rebel epidemic swept the United States in 1964-65, leaving behind literally thousands of damaged babies. Um, whose mothers had acquired rubella during pregnancy. Although rubella was a mild infection of, of children, it wasn't mild at all if it infected a pregnant woman during her first trimester. Then she could go on to deliver babies who had severe congenital abnormalities, abnormalities for the eye blindness, the, the ear deafness, the heart causing uh, uh, terrible uh, uh, abnormalities of the heart structure. And ironically, it's a virus that when it infected women in the first trimester could cause autism. In fact, in 1964 and 65, rubella was so feared that approximately 5,000 U.S. women infected with the virus chose to surgically abort their pregnancies. And 6,000 more lost fetuses to spontaneous abortions. At the time, Dr. Stanley Plotkin was working at the Wistar Institute in Philadelphia. As part of my work, at Wistar and also the Children's Hospital. I was seeing both mothers who were concerned about uh, whether to have uh, abortions because of a rubella in them and the possibility of intrauterine rubella in their infants, uh, and also uh, diagnosing the congenital uh, syndrome. Uh, those are experiences that certainly mark one. Um, and. Um, give impetus to, uh, uh, to uh, trying to prevent things like that from ever happening again. Plotkin would develop a rubella vaccine to protect a new generation. His first order of business, to acquire a strain of the virus. The virus was isolated from one of the fetuses that uh, were aborted at the mother's request because she had acquired rubella. And indeed, uh, when we obtained the fetus, it was clear that the virus had damaged the, the, the fetus. Dr. Plotkin's lab alone received material from roughly 35 pregnancies terminated because of rubella infection. His RA273 strain of rubella virus came from the third organ, the lungs, of the 27th damaged fetus he had received during the 1964-65 outbreak. To make his vaccine, Plotkin would need cells in which to grow the virus. Cells are like tiny factories, making proteins and enzymes needed by the cell and by the body. A genetic code, or DNA, provides the blueprint, instructing the cell's components on what to do. Viruses also contain a genetic code, but they can't make their own proteins, so they need to hijack the protein-making machinery of a cell to reproduce. Once inside a cell, the virus releases its genetic code, which takes over the protein-making machinery. The cell follows these new instructions and becomes an assembly line, generating thousands and thousands more virus particles. These new virus particles are an exact copy of the original virus and soon leave the cell 
so they can infect other cells. In the 1960s, researchers had typically used animal cells to grow viruses for vaccines. But the head of vaccine development at Merck, Maurice Hilleman, had recently discovered something frightening about animal cells while working to improve Jonas Salk's polio vaccine. What Dr. Hillman found was that the monkey kidney cells that were used both by Jonas Salk when he made his vaccine or Albert Sabin when he made his vaccine were contaminated with a monkey virus. It was the 40th known monkey virus of man. It was called SV40, and he, he found out soon enough that it also caused cancer in experimental animals. This made people realize that cells from animals, as primary cells from animals, uh, could be contaminated with a variety of... Uh, so-called extraneous agents, that is, viruses that you don't want in, uh, in a vaccine. The challenge for Plotkin would be to find a type of cell that didn't carry the risk of contaminating viruses. It so happened that across the hall at the Wistar Institute, Dr. Leonard Hayflick had been experimenting to better understand how and why we age. He did it using human fetal cells. Human diploid fibroblast cells uh, are, are clean, that is to say, uh, coming from uh, fetal tissue, they have no um, agents that you don't want in, in your vaccine. So I decided that in order to avoid any problems of so-called extraneous agents, that I would use human cells for the attenuation. Hayflick had received his fetal cells from Sven Gard at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, the organization responsible for the Nobel Prize. Gard had obtained the fetal tissue from an elective abortion performed in the early 1960s, a fact that would later cause controversy. 